Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to you all. I'm delighted uh, that we've come together today on International Women's Day to discuss this important topic of women as catalysts for diverse, diversity, change and resilience. At this very moment, there are about 50 leading women, just like you, who are part of this event, uh, which is taking place in eight cities, with probably over a thousand people in the audience in Europe, Asia, the Middle East, the US and Africa. We're all debating live today on International Women's Day. In a while, we'll join the head panel's meeting. It's based at the Conduit in London. We'll do that a couple of times. But most importantly, on our second visit, that's when we share our insights and key themes from our discussion today. And I'm sure it's going to be a fantastic discussion. And we're hoping to consider as we go along our journey this afternoon, the major challenges and opportunities for women and where they lie, how we can promote peace and collaboration, bearing in mind the world around us, particularly today, um, while getting on with getting ourselves into decision-making positions. So, without much ado, let me introduce you to each other um, and introduce you to those watching live. And as this has been recorded, I'll also be also introducing you to those who will come to the recording a bit later on. <clears throat> so, Marie Chowdhury, let's start with you, Marie. You're a UK qualified lawyer, finance and fintech specialism. You're sat in Dubai as a general counsel for Lean Technologies. So, welcome to you. Um, over to Annie. He, you've become an author recently following a long career in international corporate comms, and your debut novel, I'm sure you're delighted to have announced, was received with great acclaim. So, welcome again. Joan. Um, sitting in Italy at the moment, but a woman whose whole career has been in international corporate comms. Uh, you're also a guest lecturer and you mentor students. Catherine, Catherine McLeod, CEO of Dingley's Promise, is a group of nurseries whose focus is on children's special educational needs. And of course, Catherine, this is an area you're active and passionate in, and we're rewarding them be in respect of after coming back from Asia in 20, um, 2011, I believe. And welcome Molly. Molly is a journalist and also co-founder of an organisation called Us For Them, which was set up early in the pandemic, essentially being the voice of children uh, as they experienced or actually didn't experience, in all cases, education during that time. So welcome to you all. I'm really excited to have you. I'm sure we're going to have a really interesting and uh, uh, varied debate uh, when that gets going. In terms of uh, Athena 40, Athena 40 was officially launched at UNESCO on International Women's Day in March 2018. And it was launched as a women-led platform promoting the work of innovative women from around the world. Elizabeth Filippoli, who you'll see later, was part of the host panel. It was her vision to create this panel. Um, and this platform that could amplify the voices of women across the different cultures. Now, since its inception, since then, the theme 40 has gone on to develop into a family of very many initiatives focusing on the strengthening role of women worldwide and also nurturing accountable leadership for all. So before we um, meet our other panelists in the other cities, I'd like just to take a minute or two just have, have a look at the work of Athena 40 on this short video. And invite all leaders to embrace visionary and innovative thinking. By innovative thinking, we mean being open, curious and solutions focused. Athena 40 works closely with some of the most dynamic and innovative minds across all industries in order to promote gender diversity, inclusion, and bring more women into decision-making roles. We commit to enabling women to contribute to our economies. We believe that compassion and understanding are necessary values for our societies. We promote partnerships and ideas exchange among women, and of course, we include men in all conversations. We fight cliches and tribalism. 
we propose collaboration instead of segregation. We ignore labels and stereotypes. We recognize the value of diversity as a fantastic source of talent and knowledge. We stand for freedom of thought and expression. Our language speaks the truth. We stand for values-based decision-making and we fight polarization. We are broad-minded and inclusive. We believe in meaningful networking and the need to keep lifting each other up. We mentor, inspire and motivate other women of all ages and backgrounds, helping them discover their own potential. We share and learn from each other's stories. Athena 40 welcomes everyone who wishes to be part of our mission and initiatives, an international community of vision, an ongoing global conversation, a movement for compassionate, innovative, future-proof leadership. Join us. Great. Thank you, Preeti, for um, showing that. Um, now is uh, the perfect time for us to join the host panel at The Conduit. So I will switch myself off now and you'll see me um, on uh, your screen through a live stream in which um, will come to you through uh, by help from Preeti. So I'll see you in a moment. The place where I feel the most loving and loved. And after having um, studied and uh, done uh, internships and working in different countries in Europe and in the US, I decided to go back home and to some of my peers. This decision seemed a little bit too crazy and ridiculous back then because I could have pursued my career in any international organization or uh, company like the UN or Google, but my choice and my heart was here uh, because Ukraine has splendid career opportunities, um, amazing, talented, hardworking, well-educated people and I like to be um, a part of it and I belong here. That's why my choice was like this. And on Sunday, I was just outside with my baby, breathing some air as I heard the air raid siren followed by some noise. And I thought this is just the aircraft, which I heard before, but it turned out it was a missile uh, targeting the airport right on the outskirts of my city. As the result, nine people died and the airport was destroyed entirely. And as of now, 38 children were killed in this war. The youngest of them was just 18 months. And it all started in cities like Kharkiv and Kyiv with the um, shelling and attacking the military, in, military facilities and infrastructure. And the next step was um, the civilian um, uh, infrastructure like hospitals, kindergartens, and schools and residential areas. And God, I want to be wrong, but I have this nasty feeling that my home city is just one step closer to being um, shelled in its every corner. And honestly, I don't want to be a refugee, neither uh, this plus one to the dreadful statistics of the killed people. And that's why my um, Ukrainian fellows, uh, the army, the president, the volunteers do everything possible and impossible in order to have peace and security and the life as we knew it. But it's not only a fight for us Ukrainians, it's honestly the fight for whole Europe and the world because there is no peace and security with no free, sovereign and independent Ukraine. On the 9th of May, uh, we used to celebrate this victory day. Um, claiming never again, but the thing is that the history repeated itself and there is another crazy dictator with super huge ego and ambitions. And unless we stop him right um, sooner than the May, May the 9th, the, the consequences may be just awful as too many people are being killed um, of my people, Ukrainians. And, um, you know, my, my son's name is Svetoslav, as mentioned before, and in my language, um, these the, it consists of two words, meaning Sviato and Slava, which is celebration and glory. And I do hope that way sooner than May, we're going to have a, like every family in my country going to have a huge and happy celebration of free Ukraine, thanks to the glory of my brave and committed um, people. 
Слава Україні! Glory to Ukraine! Дякую! Слава Україні! Інна, дякую! Can I ask you for a round of applause? We will support you, Ina, and we support your cause. And uh, one final remark from you, if I may. When we had our conversation on Sunday, and I asked you about your people and the crisis that you are currently, the nightmare, the hell that you are currently living through, you said to me something which has stayed with me. You said that this is a moment for truth, for Ukrainians and the society to reassess your values and your own sense of belonging. I would like you to repeat that because I think this is such a strong message for all our societies and all our nations. Yeah, that's us. Uh -huh. I think we've lost the connection. Can you hear me, Ina? I think we've lost the connection again. You cannot hear me. No. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. I'm back. Yes, you are. I, I wonder if you heard what I asked you to, to repeat, that message which you gave me last Sunday about that, that momentum, which is history in the making for the whole world. And you said that for Ukrainians, this is a time to reassess your values as a society and your sense of belonging. Yes, I mean, we had uh, so many obstacles and challenges, starting with the Orange Revolution and the Revolution of Dignity and then Crimea and Donbass and everything. And maybe the lesson was not learned well enough for us and for the rest of the world um, that we have those values that we stand for. And no matter what, we have to be uh, united as a society and um, whenever we have the truth behind us, we, we have to stand for it till, till the very end. And what we see now in, in, in my country, like everyone is so super motivated and patriotic, doing every single day little tiny things that everyone can do within his or her capacity. But in the, at the end of the day, it all brings us the spirit of um, shared values and the, the spirit of uh, upcoming victory and honestly I haven't met a person who has any doubt in the victory because that wasn't us invading our country we did nothing um, to, to the Russian Federation and Mr. Putin himself um, so every every help that we get external help um, just mobilizes our efforts and um, thanks to that we feel as strong as never before. Thank you. Well, may peace prevail. Please stay strong as you are and resilient as you are. Thank you, Ina. Thank you. And so, can I ask you to come back to your seats? And now it's time to make a round around the world. A bit like the Eurovision, but without music and the outfits. <laughs> we are going to connect with uh, London first and the Evening Standard. Is that correct? Is Doug Wills there? Actually, I wonder if you should have stayed at the front row. What do you, do you think would be easier? Yeah, sorry for that, back and forth. Hello. Trying, yeah. Doug, are you there? Hello. You are? I am there. Hello. Hello, can you see me? No, we cannot see you, sadly. Can we see Doug? Oh, yeah, well, that's a shame because it's showing, you know, I'm, I'm looking very good. Yes, <laughs> we're sure you, you would. Okay, um, my, my video is recording, or rather is showing, but um, maybe it seems to be a technical hitch somewhere. So, we can uh, see you now. Me yes. See me now. Right, hello. Um, well, welcome uh, to West London. And uh, this is the offices of the Evening Standard and with the support of the London Press Club. And you can see uh, uh, about me here, my uh, panel, and uh, we have uh, five, a panel of five. And uh, we're being chaired by uh, uh, Carol Stone, who is the former BBC producer. And uh, we have the executive editor, Dawn 
uh, of the uh, Society of Editors. We have Nimco Ali, a columnist and uh, well known uh, for her campaigning. And uh, we have Anna here, uh, and Anna is content editor of, of the Evening Standard. So all of these uh, panelists are very much supporters of the ethos of today, and uh, hopefully we'll uh, be sorting the world's view accordingly uh, in the next uh, hour or so. So um, good luck to every uh, panel and, uh, and at the Conduit Club to uh, uh, all over the world. So good luck and thank you. Thank you, Doug. Good luck to you. You have a fantastic panelist, uh, panel of media executives there. And we're moving on to Zagreb, Croatia, where the panel is moderated by Leonor Skepitz, the CEO of the Montessori Group. Leonor, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear us? Yes, we can. Great. Well, um, hello, London. And actually, hello, Carol, who actually sits on the board of the Montessori Group. So I'm delighted to see her chairing the evening standard um, panel as well. Um, here in Zagreb, we actually have an invited audience, quite a large invited audience, which is lovely. And on my panel, um, we have Jennifer um, from Ipsas, which is a wellness and health um, organization that works with women to empower women. We have Christina from KPMG Croatia, Ivana, who's the CEO of the Zagreb Stock Exchange, Victoria, who's head of EBRD here in Croatia. Um, we have Villa, who is one of our young change makers of the future. Um, we have um, the very acclaimed artist Oko, who actually um, shows in London as well as in Croatia. We have Regina from um, UNICEF, head of UNICEF here in Croatia. And we have Carla from um, Solidarna, which is one of the um, leading NGOs here in the country as well. We're delighted to join all the other panels, including um, my other colleague, Max, who I know is also in London. Um, and we are looking forward to the um, discussion. Amazing. Thank and you very much. So are we. You have a rock star round table there. <laughs> Thank you. And we will come back to you in about five, 55 minutes. Now, let's move on to Beirut, where the Arab Institute of Women and its director, Miriam Sphere, is sharing a panel of primarily grassroots activists. Miriam, can you hear us? We can see you. You need to unmute yourself, Miriam. Can you hear us? I, I don't think that Miriam can hear us, but let's move on to Aman. Can Aman Jordan hear us? We will try to connect with Merina Zalbataine and then we will try Beirut again. Does Injaz hear us in Jordan? I see everyone ready and everyone engaged in conversations, which is fantastic. Hello, Aman. So, across all of your rules and regulations. Excuse me, one second. Hi, everybody. We're broadcasting from Amman, Jordan. Can you hear us? Yes, we can. Hello, Mary. Hi, Elizabeth. How are you? We're good. Happy International Women's Day. We'd love to know who's, who are your panelists. Absolutely. We have a stellar panel today of amazing women from diverse backgrounds. We have Mesa Bataine, who is the founder of Mesa Architects. Reem Abu Hassan, who has multiple roles, but we have her down as the president of the Jordanian Society for Protecting Family Violence uh, Victims. Uh, Randa Abu Hassan, the resident representative of UNDP Jordan. Shireen Mahesan, who's the co-founder of Bunny Coffee, an entrepreneur with us. And Dana Soyar, who's the CEO of Mamlaka TV. That's great. Thank you. And I see that you have already started with your conversation. So we're looking forward to coming back in about 55 minutes and hear your main conclusions from Aman. Thank you. And uh, a big, uh, big thank you to Injaz for hosting us for the fourth year. <laughs> and now we're moving thank on to so Dubai. Much. Can Helen hear us? Our panel there is hosted yes. by the UK Hi, Pavilion yeah. in Expo 2020. And the chair is social entrepreneur and triathlete, Helen Aluzaisi. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, and welcome, everyone. We are super excited to be uh, here with you today from Dubai Expo 2020 at the UK Pavilion. 
I have some amazing women. We're all trying to top each other with the fabulous women we have with us today. Um, first of all, happy International Women's Day to everyone with us. Um, today we have Caroline Faraj, who is the VP of CNN Arabic Services. We've got Diana Hamadi, who is the founder of Diana Hamadi Attorneys at Law. We have Suzanne Stuhlmeyer, who is the VP of Communications at Talabat, delivery hero for the international community. We have Rakshana Churisek Gadir, who is an, an entrepreneur and she's the founder of Possible X. And we have Fatma Amin, who is a security specialist from Bahrain Petroleum Company. So a very diverse group of people, fabulous women, and I'm super excited to be with everyone today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Helen. I will try to reconnect to Beirut. I hope Miriam this time can hear us. And if not, we will move on to Karachi. Miriam, can you hear us? No, she's not. Let's move on to Karachi. No, no, I'm here. I was just un unmuted. Okay. Oh, okay. Hi, hello, Elizabeth, everybody in London and, uh, and elsewhere. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm glad you did that uh, special session with, uh, with the Ukrainian. Uh, next year, you will also consider some of the females across the world in, in Kashmir and Palestine as well to share their thoughts. Thank you, Moaz. Good evening. I am Sayyid Moaz Shah, Director at the Center for Human Rights at Ziauddin University in the Faculty of Law, Politics and Governance. I will host and moderate of the Pakistan panel uh, being hosted by Ziauddin Live. We, uh, we are joined by members of the public, student and faculty, as you can see here. And I'm also joined by our panelists, uh, starting from uh, the left, uh, Dr. Masuma Hassan, uh, who is uh, a seasoned diplomat, not only served as an ambassador to Austria, Slovenia and Slovakia on behalf of Pakistan, but also as the chair for the group of 77 in the United Nations and represented Pakistan in the International Atomic Energy Agency the IAEA. She currently serves as a chairperson for the Pakistan Institute for International Affairs, the PIIA, the leading and oldest think tank in Pakistan. Uh, we also are joined by Dr. Uh, Qureshi, who's sitting in the middle. Uh, she is Sarah Qureshi, uh, who traveled all the way here from Islamabad to be with us, Elizabeth. Uh, she is the CEO of Aero Engine Aircraft, the first private aviation company in Pakistan that focuses on environmental friendly aircraft engines. She has a successful pilot and she's going in phase two to take it to the skies uh, in an actual plane. Uh, and last but not least, we have Tasneem Ahmer, who's uh, uh, the last of our panelists here. Um, she's a veteran with over 25 years of experience in the media, not only as a journalist, but as an advocate for women's rights, gender equity, gender sensitization and media monitoring. She's the founder of UKS, a research resource and publication center dedicated to the cause of gender equity and equality and women development. Amazing. So, Elizabeth, we'll connect with you then here. Uh, yes, we will. Uh, share our thoughts. We'll be back in about 50, 55 minutes to, uh, to hear what the main findings and calls to action from Pakistan are. Thank you so much. Uh, Miriam, are you with us? I say that you... <laughs> We're trying to connect with you. Yes, it, it sounds, well, it seems, it appears to be a very engaging conversation, but we need to hear the room. Hi, Elizabeth, I'm here. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so, uh, I'm very sorry about that. I had to interrupt my guests. So hello, everyone. I'm connecting from Beirut. We're at the Arab Institute for Women at the Lebanese American University. We have exceptional change makers with us. Who are sharing their stories and I'm very sorry that I had to uh, interrupt them and their insightful uh, 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 deliberations today. So I have with me Reem Badran who's a university student and, a found, and the founder of Girl Up Lebanon and she's a student of ours here at LAU. I have Rachel Dor Weeks with me who is the head of UN Women Lebanon and basically a partner of the Arab Institute for Women. We work closely with UN Women. I have Dalal Mawad, who is an independent award-winning Lebanese journalist. She currently works for CNN and teaches at Sciences Po in Paris. And I have Naya Rai, who is another colleague of ours. She's currently working with us, and she is co-founder of Harass Tracker, an initiative to fight the normalization of sexual harassment in Lebanon. 
So I'm, uh, this is our panel and we're having an interesting discussion and we're going to leave you now to continue the discussion. Wow. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Thank you, Miriam. You Lebanese women are role models and we admire and respect you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> and now let's move back to London and connect with Montessori, MCI and Max Pescatore. Good Hello, afternoon, Elizabeth. Max. Hello, Elizabeth. Hello, everybody. Um, uh, Max Pescatore, I'm the CEO of MCI, part of Montessori Group. Uh, in keeping with the uh, international status of our group, we work not only in the UK, but internationally. Uh, my panellists also reflect not only London, but also three other counties within England. And we have one panellist sitting in Rome and the other in Dubai. And they are Molly Kingsley, who is a journalist here in the UK, but also co-founder of an organisation called As For Them, started in the pandemic, early in the pandemic, to represent the voice of children, particularly as they were experiencing or not experiencing education as we went through that time. Marie Chowdhury, who is sitting in Dubai, UK qualified lawyer, now a fintech and finance specialist, and she's general counsel for Lean Technologies. Annie Garthwaite, after many years as an international corporate comms leader, is now an acclaimed novelist here in the UK. Um, Joan Wazilik, who's sitting in Rome, has spent all of her working career as an international corporate comms um, executive leader. She's also a guest lecturer and mentors students. And Catherine McLeod, who is the CEO of Dingley's Promise, which is a group of nurseries here in the UK that specialise with children with special educational needs. But she herself is a passionate uh, advocate and very active in that field. And in fact, got her MBE awarded to her for work she did in Asia um, 10 or 15, 20 years ago. I'm delighted to have them all on my panel today. Thank you. And we are delighted to have you with us. And thank you for hosting a panel for a second year. And now let's move on to Birmingham, which, as you can see, is a very young panel. Hello, Millie. Hi, everyone. Hi, Elizabeth. Um, thank you very much for joining us from Birmingham, as you said. Um, I'm here with DebateMate, and I'm being joined by six incredible young women from the George Dixon Academy, which is a school local to the centre where we are today. Uh, the names of the students with me are Joanna, Amelia, Amandi, Michaela, Sophia and Karina and we're really excited to contribute to this conversation and give a youth perspective on how women can really act as catalysts for resilience, diversity and change. Hello, hello everyone. Um, okay, the time has come for us to start our discussion. Um, I really want to start the conversation today with this sort of quite broad open question and, and maybe we can sort of build upon that. I'm really interested to understand your own personal experiences and experiences of those women around you that may have, may have had or come across um, bias in one way, shape or form. Um, obviously, women's plight has been one that we uh, seem to be combating this over time, but it'd be really interesting to see you know, what experience are today and how it might have changed over time. I don't know if I can start with possibly Annie. Would you like to start us off? Yeah, I was reflecting on this last night, actually, how things have changed for women in the workplace in the sort of too many years that I've been in it. And um, I recall that back in the sort of mid eighties when I was a graduate and applying for jobs in publishing and then in public relations, <laughs> the only way to get a start as a woman was to have taken, a, to take the secretarial route in and hope to work your way up. So there's no point applying to a job if you didn't have typing skills, for example. And oddly, the same uh, requirement was not made of men at entry level positions in those industries then. And, you know, 1985 was a long time ago, so one, one hopes that things have changed mm. somewhat by then and that the discrimination is at least less overt. But I still think that women to get on in the workplace have to do a lot more in order to excel, they have to demonstrate competence at every level. And I think there's a very different approach for men. You know, when men fly by the seat of their pants, they're seen as courageous 
risk takers. That when women fly by the seat of their pants, they're seen as flaky and difficult. Um, I just yeah. think you know, we need to, it, it goes right back to the beginning, doesn't it, of how we objectify, of how we look at women and look at men in their roles at work. And it's behavioural more than institutional in some way. Right? Yeah, I think that's very interesting. And I think and there's, you covered a lot of um, areas there, I think. Uh, before, I think before we sort of pick on one or two of those, Maria, I'd be quite interested to hear your take on that, being at the sort of, dare I say it, younger age at scale range to me, or age range to me. <laughs> Thanks, Max. So uh, again, I was reflecting on this as well in terms of what sort of biases have I experienced across my career. Um, and I think th the biggest one that really stood out for me or really stands out for me is being pulled aside by, um, you know, this is a couple of years ago, being pulled aside by a senior associate slash partner and being told uh, or being criticised for being too ambitious. Um, now, that really stuck with me because it, it, it kind of questioned who I am. You know, I am an ambitious person. I am driven. What does that mean? Why, why am I being criticized for that? Because, you know, I'm going out there building business, you know, building these client relationships. And it quickly sort of made me realize that, you know, my, my fellow male peers weren't being criticized for the same things. So for me, very early on, that was something that sort of I realized that actually there was this sort of likability attribute that I had to nurture in order so that I didn't come across as bossy or I didn't come across as too assertive. Whereas, as I say, my, my male counterparts, that, that was a positive for them. Yeah, have you found that that's changed over time? Um, I think it's, uh, yeah, I, I think it's getting better. But I think it's important that we have these conversations and that we acknowledge those and we challenge those. You know, when someone brought that up to me, I didn't have the tools in my in my sort of toolkit to say, do you know what? I don't quite agree with that approach. You know, I didn't have that sort of ability to say it outright. Whereas I think now, you know, working with um, some of my junior female peers, saying to them that you know this is what I experienced and actually you don't have to accept that you can disagree um, and this is why so I think having the conversation has meant that it, it will change or it is changing. Mm. And there's something about um, uh, the sort of the sector and, and, and the, the mix of things and law profession I think on balance is about 50-50 male-female split certainly within the professions in the UK. Um, I don't know if that's if that's helpful or not helpful in context of this maybe so, so in terms of um the legal profession as a whole it's now it's it's much better in terms of entry level so it's much more sort of 50 50 in terms of women coming through but what you see as women take on more sort of decision making or senior management roles the number of women drops off so I think, you know, us as, you know, without sort of like jumping ahead of the conversation, but us as sort of female leaders or more senior members of the management team, we need to acknowledge that and, and ask the questions, why is that happening? Um, uh, yeah, that, that's interesting. And uh, uh, that issue, that is a, is a theme that I think is repeated across various sectors, you know, whether it's education, whether it's publishing, whether it's, you know, anything and everything. Um, there, there, there is a point it was sort of started sort of the same place and then there's a divergence that happens and uh, it becomes more fragmented as you go along. And, um, other panellists, what, what are your views? Catherine? Yeah, I, I, think, um, I think it's more nuanced now than it ever has been before and it's actually sometimes quite hard to call people out because while you feel it's happening and women you know feel it's happening, the men sort of go, what? No, 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 it wasn't meant that way, Catherine. No, no, no. And I think I think I've certainly noticed it as a woman. And I think people assume charity is going to be better because we're all nice people. <laughs> I don't think that's true either. I think there's just as much of this in, in the charity sector as well. And you certainly feel uh, in meetings that the woman's point of view is heard, but is often... Uh, either challenged more I've certainly had meetings where I've been really really challenged on things whereas a man has said something very similar and had no challenge at all and I sit there and think to myself why is that and I think it's because of my gender potentially mm. um, but all, also I think um, that we you know, I, I've been in a meeting where there's been all men and maybe two female CEOs 
in this group. And one of the group, the guy just turns around to one next to him and says, oh, you know, women, the way they dress when they come into work, oh, I don't want them to come in all tits and arse. And I sat there and I was so shocked with what he'd said. You were in the <laughs> room. You were in the I room. I was in the room, <laughs> yeah. I heard it. Yeah. And it was that moment when you sit there and I, I think I was so shocked I didn't say anything for a second. And then I just turned around and said, well, you know, I said that's not appropriate. But the fact that he thought that was OK to say, mm. A, in a room of leaders and also B, in a room of mixed leaders. I was just mm. that's probably the most the most striking thing that's happened to me in the last few years where I've just thought, you know, that <laughs> old boys club. And he wasn't old, actually. I don't mean that in age. Yeah, that's men, that still exists very strongly but i like to um sort of pick up later on sort of uh, where this all starts from it's clear that's a lack of respect that's that's greater than the room in which it was said that's sort of quite fundamental but before we do that molly I, you know being a journalist that's a pretty pretty up and down type of world isn't it um what is what is your experience of this well actually i mean far less in recent years because i think with us for them i think I've become a lot more assertive, actually. I think rewinding. So I started as a corporate lawyer, so I did that for 10 years. I then had my own startup. And I think in both of those um, spheres, I mean, examples were just too numerous and also too, like, in your face to really believe sometimes. So, like, I mean, I had the classic thing in a law firm. I worked in a big magic circle law firm, very, very old school um, you know, one of these places, you know, exactly as you said, Marie, even now the rate of male to female partners is probably about 10 to 1, I would say, maybe 8 to 2, but really, even though down lower down, of course, it's all 50-50, but yeah. Um, and, you know, I used to get asked to make the tea and things like that as, as actually quite a senior associate in my own right. And I, yeah, exactly. I had one, the best one, which I will write about one day was when I was pitching, this was when I was in a startup. Um, and I was pitching for, you know, like not an insignificant amount of money. I, there were seven men, little boys pitching before me. I was eight months pregnant at the time, not easy anyway. And, you know, in my kind of mid thirties then, and I was last in the lineup, which in itself was a bit weird, but you know, you kind of roll your eyes and think whatever, but it means you've got a tired audience, tired audience of all men, mainly men, because this was you know London bankers and I got introduced everyone else got introduced by the merit of their business so you know this is John he's going to change the world blah blah, blah. and I was and here's Molly and isn't she a well-presented little lady literally <laughs> and also I was huge because I was eight months pregnant so I was like you really couldn't have done anything to put me down and this was a very senior man who was quite well known in the banking world and I just um yeah so anyway I would like to think it's changed I think my only recent experience of that was when I was on and there hasn't really been anything like that actually there hadn't been in us for them because I think by its nature we have been so assertive and ballsy we just don't take that anymore but I did have a call about six months ago with three people who should remain nameless because they are all quite well known there's one senior policy one senior politician politician senior policy person in the children's world and a senior business person and they introduced each other so they were all men in their 50s and 60s and they introduced each other and no one introduced me on the call <laughs> so I was like sat there like a, you know, just really embarrassing well, and really, after yeah. a yeah and they just started this this meeting without me and I was there and so after about three or four minutes I was like sorry is anyone going to introduce me because do you understand how rude that is and they were like horrified then and it was obviously really awkward call and I've so, never so talked was, to any of them since but do you think the team the calling out was the embarrassing thing or the realization there was something to be called out for I mean I I don't know I think it was quite deliberate I think I mean there were probably other dynamics at stake I think I think at least one of those people didn't really want us for them on the call yeah, yeah. but I don't okay. think they would have done that to a man Mm -hmm. um, right no it's it's shocking and i'm um i was expecting to get some, some stories here but these stories are in a way far worse than those i was expecting in my mind's eye so in my mind's eye, i'm i'm thinking you know we've um, when i joined uh, you know, stepped into working life 25 30 years ago life was very different and uh, i hope things have moved on but they've moved on but it sort of feels like it's three steps forward and maybe one and a half steps backwards um, before before we just move on, Joan, I, um, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this because you know you've been in 
corporates for all of your life and often the only woman in the room as well so and you've and you, and you certainly seek that out sort that out yes apologies for the technical issues over here um yeah i think i think for me there's uh, to add to the stories that you already have i think there's also the financial parity issue um my work has been primarily in b2b helping companies tell their story where they fit into you know the social narrative and many while they're not whole household names they've been they are global leaders and mostly male dominated um industries so in hiring me while they did work through i was brought gender diversity um, I think there's also a financial parity issue that really in some of these industries exists still today. And it, that begins right away with the, with the interviewing process, contract negotiations. You have to fight to get the same rewards as the same or lesser qualified men. And, and I've seen that continue also straight through into, you know, raises for performance, bonuses, benefits, even, even the degree to which... Um, companies have been prepared to invest in further professional growth. I think you, you have to stay on the case for that um, and really seek it out uh, more so than perhaps some men do. Mm -hmm. I think that still exists. I think progress has been made. Um, compensation, transparency, female network, and just one's own maturity do help those scenarios. But I think it's something that still exists and, and, and does need some work. Mm. Well, there's quite a bit of research in this area as always I mean there's always research it comes out with the conclusion and um, we go away nothing has changed very much there's more research it comes out with pretty much the same set of conclusions and so we seem to be continuing and you know, recently McKinsey has said you know where there are companies that are in the top quartile of diversity in the exec um, team in the, sort of, in the boardroom those companies are 25 percent more likely to have success uh, above, to be above average uh, and, and even more work that's been done by the universities of Glasgow and Leicester have, have looked at, you know, those uh, exec teams of boards that are at least 30% women-led actually outperform those that haven't. So the statistics speak for themselves, but yet, but yet, despite all of that, we, we still have got these challenges. So, mm -hmm. you know, with, with young women at the forefront of what our minds, you know, and, how, and preparing the world for them to step into, you know, how do we go about trying to tackle some of these some of these issues? How how do we get underneath the skin of that? You talked about um, you know you, you talked about financial dexterity, Jane, or access to finances. Um, you know, is is better education further earlier on in the, the sort of things uh, will that help or, or not? Well, I think within the company that you're in to get together with the other women in the group, the senior whatever level you're at and try and find some transparency between yourselves. Uh, if you're a group leader, you know what your teams are earning, you know what you're earning. If you're prepared to be brave about it in some cultures, there's, there's less comfort discussing personal salaries, et cetera. But I think if you network within your own company and you begin to learn what the information and the status quo is, I think that gives you, you're much better informed in order to be able to um, take a stand, but also too, to ensure that you yourself are providing parity within your own teams and the functions that you're leading. Could I just, just add as well, I think there's sort of, there's two sides to it as well. There is the side that the systems that are used for recruitment and um, employment are focused on people who demand money. And traditionally, unfortunately that is men. And so I think it is about dismantling those systems but also I think it's about from absolute back to basics it is talking about girls and they you know assertive is good it's not negative and you should know your worth and you should demand your worth and still now when we're recruiting um, it's always you know female that feeling oh you know should I ask for more am I worth more or oh, I don't know well, that might be impolite I won't ask and yet men will come in and go, that's not enough for my salary. I need this much. I'm not saying it's all men and all women, because yes. obviously we're all different. But the pattern is very much that. So it's it's about right from the beginning, supporting women to feel strong in themselves, believe in themselves and demand what they deserve, I think. Mm. I think we're still encouraged to think that we should be grateful for the opportunity. Yeah. I was just I was just going to jump in there and I, I, I couldn't agree more. I think we need to start young and I think we need to start 
uh, being really mindful about the language that we use around young people, um, both male and, uh, male and female, in terms of, you know, the language like, why is someone, why is a girl called bossy, yet a boy is assertive? You know, these are leadership traits that we should be really sort of instilling and propelling, you know, young people forward with, but both male and female, it needs to, it needs to come across for both genders. Um, so yeah, I, I couldn't agree more in terms of that sort of confidence building from a young age. And language is important, isn't it? Because language paints pictures and it's the picture, it's back to sort of role models. You know, you can't beat if you can't see it, you know, and, and people label you in a certain way and, be, and, and see you behave in a particular way. Um, so that, that is very, very important, absolutely. Um, but if we try and bring that lens back then to, you know, making changes earlier, um, is that, is that, at school, is that at primary school? Is that where is that? Where where does this change need to happen? I think it's at, at school and in the home. If I look at so often, if I find if I look at the young people, young women, just in that I know, you know, who are doing really well and achieving and emerging as as leaders, um, they have really strong female role models at home. You know, and not necessarily, I'm not saying, you know, that all of their mothers are, are, are superpower career women, not necessarily at all, but their mothers are women who know what they want and go and get it, you know, and provide that example for their, for their daughters. So then it has to start at home, then it has to be reinforced in school. And, and in the home, I guess, you know, there's, there's often two parents um, and let's talk about male female dynamics. That's the one that's where the conflict exists, of course. So, you know, my, both mum and dad have to be supportive of each other, don't they? It's that sort of mutual self-respect respect and self-respect um, to, to nurture the, uh, the child and put the right ecosystem around that child for children. Um, so that's, that's very important. Um, Molly, you know, as, as for them, obviously you, you have, you're the voice of, you know, tens of thousands of parents at the moment. Um, do, you, do you see any sort of um, opportunities there for, for changes to be made or do you see any particular behaviours and characteristics which would endorse or otherwise what we've been talking about? Yeah, I mean, oh, I think it's just such a difficult area because I think my personal view on this is that we won't see real change. And I think Max, this is a point we discussed the other day, wasn't it? I don't think we would see change until the underlying all the kind of background structure and systems have changed. So to my mind, having kind of lived this, as I'm sure we all have, you know, we have a very uneven terrain for women. We all want equality, but actually we don't have childcare equality and we don't, you know, we don't have adequate childcare, but we don't have equality between the, the sexes. And until that happens, I, my personal view is we're kind of shouting, you know, everything else is window dressing because we're not, fixing the central problem here yeah. which is as Marie said women get to a point where they get senior in their careers they have children and that is an impossible conflict that our society hasn't resolved so going back to kind of you know my work through us for them obviously yes a lot of that is about empowering women to speak up and hopefully we've done some of that but actually you know to be able to do that in a way that it, you know all, all we've really been doing is fighting other people's fighting the men's fires trying to put out that crisis we've not really changed anything for the better yeah. <laughs> but actually and I think to be able to move forward and do that positively actually we've got to hit that problem head on and I do hope that's where the the parent network we have will will come in yeah I mean again the past 20 years um uh, working mums and well, mums going into work, so starting employment, that rate um, has, has just increased phenomenally. Um, and it's a faster rate than women with no children or indeed men with or without children uh, entering the workplace. So, you know, there's lots more women, working women trying to get into work um, at a faster, and, and that's ever increasing. However, over that time period, the, the infrastructure that sits around the workplace really hasn't changed and, and there's where the crunch happens and around all of that of course is uh, enabling provision like uh, access to good quality childcare and education everywhere where it's needed. Um, it was a really a phenomenal statistic put out by CPP Medicine Work last year around this and they said in a scenario where a woman in the UK can work the hours that she wants to work 
uh, largely by being given access to childcare provision where she wants it, then women's earnings will increase by between 8 billion and 11 billion per annum and adding nearly 30 billion to the economy, right? And when you, when you put in context that in the UK, SME, small and medium enterprises contribute about 85 billion, you know, that really mm. is something that we're you know, talking about and uh, the mm. impact of, of that. Um, but, so yes, it's, it's hugely important um, trying to dismantle all of that. Um, there are companies, um, large and small, making uh, headway or trying to make headway to try and change entitlements and policies and, and everything else. And, uh, uh, so there is some some work being done. Do we just feel that that's just not enough in the wrong place? Do we need to do things differently? I mean, in my it, obviously, Shaz Fane has got ideas, but from what from what I've seen, far too companies, far too few companies do it. And I think, you know, we've we've got a. I mean, I think you've got different problems to unpick, haven't you? You've got the lack of universal and affordable childcare, as you well know, Max. Mm -hmm. But you've also got the parental leave system, and I think we can all say that the shared parental leave system has just failed here. Mm -hmm. And we, we have a lack of political will to even acknowledge the problem, I think. Um, so there are, I wouldn't, you know, from what I've seen and from what the parents in our group tell us, there are definitely companies doing really admirable things, but they're the exception, not, not the rule. Mm. Yeah. If I may I, I, like, I, I jump in here as well. So I, I'm, I'm currently obviously GC of a, a technology company and we're actually headquartered in KSA. But we have offices around the world so we primarily work in the middle east but we have a, a london a uk office as well one of the first things that i came when i came in to do was to look at our paternity leave so obviously in the uk um there are specific rules around this but in the middle east it's it's less so now some of these laws are changing but one of the things that i was really advocating for when i came in was around sort of shared parental leave, making sure we honor and we, we really encourage our employees to take parental leave. Now for me, I, like going back to that question, Max, are companies doing enough? I always think companies can do more. Um, you know, that's always sort of the, the stance. Um, the challenge that I had with the CEO was like, this is a business and you know he needs to focus on the bottom line. But ultimately, I also think it is a tone from the top. So I was the first female uh, person on the management team. So the fact that I'm bringing this up and I'm, I'm making them aware of this issue, and it was actually our, it was our male colleagues who first used the maternity paternity uh, policy in the company. And they sort of appreciated the time that they were able to spend with their newborns. And as I say, that, that was a sort of male employees. And we had a few in sort of quick succession. So I think it's important that companies do take a stance and try and improve on what the governments around the world have put in place because I think we need to change but it comes from the top the tone from the top really does help. Mm. It's interesting and just to pick up on your quote Molly you said you know um, women often have the courage and tenacity to fight for change where sometimes men don't and I think Marie you're an example of exactly that so well done you you sort of one by one changing hearts and minds um, on that. Um, you know, you. you've got to bring, it's, it, you know, this can't be a them and us, can it? This is not men versus women. It's, this is not that conversation. This is about finding women for everybody and, and women in particular who uh, not, don't appear to be dealt in even hand to begin with. Um, well, I think that's a really important point. And actually, I think that if it can be framed as a man's, as much like what's the upside, like you say, Marie, for men, like that's going to be the answer here and you know I hate to say but actually it, it would you know we'll get much further if we can stand on the shoulders of some men like let's mm. face it um actually Josh Glancy did anyone see that article he wrote about it it was God, probably about six months ago now but he wrote a really powerful piece about you know how shared parental leave is an idea whose time has come and yeah um, and I think you know if, if, if we get to a point where at the start of a, fa a family's journey, that that's is the attitude that is the default. Then you almost 
expect that hope that then the nurturing that goes on within that family unit has also got off to a good start and um, back to enabling girls and young, uh, young boys and young girls to see the world for your women through the same perspective I think is is where we sort of need to head um, I don't know if anyone's got any thoughts on, on that well, and, the, and I guess you know <laughs> this is a moment in time where on this one we ha we have to demonstrate some resilience because I think so many businesses at the moment you know with Brexit, the cost of living crisis, rising prices, war in Ukraine, everything else, businesses are just in survival mode. They're just in, you know, hold the line, hold the line. <laughs> so yeah. getting a boardroom to focus now on issues like this is going to be a really tough ask. And we just have to keep hammering away to it. We have to be resilient. Mm. We, we do, and I, but I think, I think it's also around... Um, the way people have conversations as well because as somebody who's a mother and has two children and a husband who does more of the child care than I do um, I'm always sort of I get in, I have these conversations with people men and women oh well, poor you oh, you don't spend much time with your children do you oh who's picking them up schools calling me instead of calling my husband because yeah. of course I'm the mum and therefore I'm the one expected to be ready to, to go and sort things out and it's just sort of I know people think it's you know they're having a nice chat and they're empathizing with you oh you must be really sad because you're traveling you're not with your children <laughs> I'm sort of like well, I'm sorry maybe I'm a bad person but actually <laughs> I really love my job and if I was a man traveling all over the place you wouldn't even be asking me this yeah. but it's yeah. about those conversations mm -hmm. as well I think and people really checking with themselves is this is this all right to say to this person <laughs> yes yeah absolutely absolutely um if I could, I think perhaps we might have another window of opportunity to be exploited still to be determined from the pandemic with the number of people working from home. Uh, the impact on family dynamics is going to, you know, be studied forever. Uh, there's, it's very, a very rich scene, but I do think it could also be engendering conversations at home as well as in business offices. The new hybrid working structure, how, and it will be as different as each family unit. But perhaps that will be an unlooked for um, motivator for change as well. To wit, the, 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 the earlier comment about, you know, and I agree with Annie, companies are looking to survive, but at the same time, they're having to ensure that they keep the skill sets that they want. And some of those possessors of the skill sets are having a different look at how they may want to work. I think that's really true, particularly with the younger generation coming through as well and joining work. Um, I think people are looking at different different uh, motivators or different factors for why they want to get into a particular line of business or a particular industry. It's I, I think it's less so. It, obviously, money is still a, a big mo motivating factor, but a lot of it is less so now. I think there is a lot more about balance and boundaries. Um, I actually read an interesting report uh, just the other day from Grant Thornton about the pandemic, um, and it, it, it was talking about obviously we have uh, you know we are yet to see the outcomes of on sort of the gender balance and what covid has has done to sort of the situation but at the same time this is a window of opportunity for us to catalyze on in in the sense that you know we do now have agile working lots of companies have got a flexible approach to being in the office versus being at home um you know i was very fortunate that before that before the pandemic, I actually negotiated with a boss of mine when I was working in London to have one day a week at home. And I, you know, I remember writing down, like, you know, like in a journal or whatever, like the one day that I was at home, I was so grateful that I was at home because I was able to kind of get my head down, focus more on my work, have a, a days long, you know, uninterrupted period of work. But I was so grateful because I, you know, I didn't have kids and I, I really had to fight my business case. You know, those days are long gone. And I think the yes. expectation now is that there's going to be this hybrid sometimes in and sometimes out. And I know that I'm very sort of vocal with that with my team here in Dubai, that that is what I expect. I think there needs to be, for me at least, some office time, some face time, because I think that's the, the way you learn from conversations, being pulled into meetings, being pulled onto calls. But at the same time, I acknowledge that for myself, having that one day, uh, you know, working from home a week when I was in my sort of junior side of my career, that was so beneficial, not just to my, my work 
and, and sort of getting things done, but also my mental health, you know, the ability to be able to, you know, wake up a little bit later or like, you know, work, you know, work on a contract while I was in bed having a cup of coffee, as opposed to on the tube traveling across London, you know, it just changed my outlook on things. So I think, I think that's an opportunity. Yes, I think, I think that's very right. And, you know, the, for all intents and purposes, the pandemic was akin to a world war, wasn't it? When, and I probably probably the thing to, Apologies for that upset, but it wasn't meant, meant that to be an upsetting remark. But what I was trying to get at, you know, these periods of seismic change when everything gets thrown up into the air, actually there are as many opportunities if you look in the right way that there are downsides, and it's, and it's, it's capitalising on that. But I think what's really important from what you've all said is around working from home and the change in the recalibration, all of that is actually putting pressure on employers. And employers are people, remember, at the end of the day, aren't they? They don't want to sort of make, make believe imaginary thing. These are people. But it's putting pressure on, on people and leadership, which is predominantly men, to trust employees, to, to look at employees as an equal, as an individual, rather than a working unit that is, you know, something you, that you do something to when you pay them to do something. Um, so, and with that, and if you imagine this is a bit of a shift in the psychology of, of working relationships, can that help the, the woman potential leader? Can that help her step step into a space if, as a worker, she seemed to be different, as, as men seem to be different? Um, can that create a space for women to step into leadership in a way that's more authentic to them, as opposed to try to emulate or step into a space because uh, that's the gap that's filled and she ought to behave that way? Um, I think there's a really big opportunity at the moment in that the pandemic has made us think about what is important, what is leadership, you know, it is about mental health, it is about work-life balance, I think in a way that we've never gone that far <laughs> before, and I think that now certainly there's a lot of discussion about what is leadership, what is good leadership, and I think over the pandemic there was a lot, many, many examples of real vulnerability in leaders, and, you know, opening up to people and saying, I don't know all the answers, but we'll get there. And I just think that that more real and authentic leadership is something that has been growing before, but has been massively fast-tracked by the pandemic. And I, I feel that actually that is an area where often women leaders feel more comfortable. And actually that I think in itself will drive forward more opportunities for women leaders because the whole world is starting to see the value of what we traditionally thought of as soft skills, but which are actually hard skills because they do, they bring teams together and they make things happen. Mm. But I think before we hadn't valued those. Mm. Mm. I think that's a very good point. Does anybody else have a, have a comment on, on that? That sort of talks back to this, this piece of research that came out and said, you know, if you have at least 30% of women on exec positions on boards, you know, great things happen. You know, it's that, that diversity of thought, that diversity of contribution that, that we can bring. I mean, it couldn't be much worse, could it? Then? <laughs> well, so, you know, like we could only, and it, it, it's why there is obviously an opportunity because everywhere you look, I'm sorry to be blunt about it, and I know this will come across as sexist, so I don't say it publicly, but men are just fucking up the world. Like they are. And, um, like actually if we don't step up now like when are we going to but i guess the issue that we have is that the you know as we've been talking about like the systems are rigged like it is rigged against us in so many different ways and yeah still there's still <laughs> still well still. You, you know with, with all this is an opportunity head on for a minute because that feels quite optimistic um <laughs> uh, <laughs> let's stick with that for a moment uh, you know how you know how can we uh, make even small steps to try and create the environment that would enable a young woman to want to step into you know one of your shoes or any shoes or and any of you you know because you're all role models you you and we all sort of um, are flying a flag of you know you can do this whatever this is um, you know what what would be telling our younger selves right now I know I do what, think there's a a big oh, thing about just just doing it and trying it actually is that, is that a confident thing do you, do you think 
I think it is. So I think when I look back particularly to us for them, the I, it started with a blog post that I wrote and I showed this and I was writing then, but, you know, probably being too perfectionist about it. And every article was taking like three weeks and blah, blah, blah. And I did this very impassioned blog post. I showed to my husband. My husband was like, oh, no, you can't publish that. So, <laughs> um, so I was like, fine, and just stuck it on my blog. And then, that got retweeted by a journalist. And, you know, like literally none of the rest would have happened if I'd. And I read back now, to be fair to my husband, I wince at reading. It's an awful <laughs> you know awfully written piece that is far from perfect but actually it didn't matter and I do think there is something when you see and it, I do think it is a female trait and it's not hard to work out why that might be is it given what we're we're saying yeah. like women are less confident than they're kind yeah. of taught they can't and, and, achieve yeah and I guess you know a world I mean thankfully I'm too old for this but you know the social media world where there's pictures of your best friends looking immaculately turned out with pouting lips or whatever else there might be. So there's these images that are out there that say this is what you ought to be like, which is a distraction and it's, it's a pull from the authenticity. Uh, I think it's a, I think actually the role of image is really important in this because it amazes me how much emphasis women still put on that and I, you know I, I so I'm probably the other extreme with this now and I very rarely wear makeup I usually haven't even managed to brush my hair and I wouldn't advocate for that either but <laughs> I have to say I have you know I, it's that when I think back to my 20s when I'd wear high heels like this full makeup lipstick and you kind of think actually that that did not do me any good at all because, you, you know, you're not taken seriously in a room with men, I think, sometimes if you're too done up. And I know that's an awful thing to say and probably not a PC thing to say, but I do think teaching girls that actually it's about so much more than how they look would be a very good start. Mm. But it's very hard because it's very important because I mean, I've got an eight year old daughter who spends like, hours in the morning before school in front of the mirror. And Well, you know, puberty is a thing, isn't it? It's a chemical mm you know, chemicals happen and, and I think both boys and girls go through their own version of that, but uh, clearly I think for, for women I've it's... I've got to say, Molly, honestly, makeup is one of my pet peeves. I can't, I, ugh, I don't wear makeup daily and I've been pulled aside and said, you know, you're a CEO now, you should probably wear some makeup. No. <laughs> and, I just, and it's wow. things like that where I just sort of, you know, again, no man's expected to wear makeup. No. So why am I oh, supposed oh. to be here to look pretty for you? What is it? <laughs> well, obviously, you, I, you ladies, you ladies didn't read the, read the small script that said make sure you're using pink nail varnish for this session. <laughs> <laughs> but it is. Oh, like so that, we I slip back to the 1950s. When did that happen? <laughs> but it's the other thing about it all as well is it's all time. So actually, like, yes. I, you know, particularly when you've got kids, you're back, like, every second counts. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> the thought of, like, the extra, and I do occasionally, you know, I'm like, I did put some stuff under my, like, eye bags at least. But, you know, when you do, like, Zoom stuff and media stuff, but actually, it's more like, you know, I could be spending this five minutes learning some stats that might make me sound credible, or I could be putting some lipstick on. And I think my 20 and 30 year old self would have always opted for the former. And I guess, yes. you know, maybe teaching our daughters in particular that you opt for the latter. Mm. Mm. Like just to kind of give the sort of the dissenting voice here mm. or just a different viewpoint. I, I think for me, it's not like it's about choice, right? It, it's, yeah. it, we shouldn't be um, stuck behind the bias that women have to wear makeup. The fact that someone called you out and said, you know, Catherine, you, as a CEO, you need to wear <laughs> makeup. Now, frankly, that's ridiculous. But for me, it's like, but if you if you want to make, wear makeup, then equally, you shouldn't be told that you're wearing too much makeup and not be taken seriously. So for me, it's more about, you know, why aren't, why aren't we reframing the conversation so that it's about that individual's personal choice and whether I come to work with makeup or not mm. shouldn't impact the way or my, my work output and how I'm seen in that boardroom or how I'm seen presenting to a regulator or, or whoever. Like that, for me, that's what it's more about as opposed to sort of, Yes or no? Yeah. And, and, and actually just sort of taking taking that on a bit more, it applies to men also, doesn't it? And in a way, is yeah. the counter to that, the fact that less so now, but certainly in the past, you no know, suit and tie and the rigidity of the uniform and, you know, belonging to the right institutions and having gone to the right clubs was so important. 
for even men to be able to take a step into their careers. Is it simply a, you know, that, that, you know, we're still sort of working within that constraint, even though we don't necessarily see that, and that constraint is just pushed onto everybody, men and women, um, that expectation that you have to conform or not conform mm -hmm. to the that said, I would I would say I have always taken and, and I started my career with a being handed a book called Dress for Success, which some of you may remember. Um, but I have also found it, though, quite helpful to have a work uniform, uh, a professional looking work uniform. It takes a while to to get it to suit your own style to be true. But I think if you have a, a uniform that you can quickly get into, and uh, you know Barack Obama has already mentioned it, but I got there before he did. Um, you just simply then are presented. You are you fit in without necessarily being uh, male dressed, but it enables you as a person knowing that you look professional. It also they take a quick look. Yes, tick the box. This person looks professional. Let's move on to what that person has to say, male or female. And for me, I still find that quite helpful um, because you know that people are going to be concentrating actually on what you have to say. Perhaps that comes with a bit of seniority as well. But at the same time, there is a, an argument to be made for, a, depending the scenario you're in, and I think the point about choice is, is very true, but there are some circumstances where having something that equates to a uniform, if you will, it creates a parity in some ways mm -hmm. that you then step forward and the focus is on what you're saying, what you're doing, how you perform. So, yeah. And, and that sort of, in a way, resonates with the comment Marie made. It's about finding the authentic way. And if, if you do it your mm -hmm. way, you find your style and your way to get comfortable, then mm -hmm. it's an extension of you and that's, that ought to be more than sufficient. Yeah. Yeah. And um, we've got a, a few more minutes left. Um, I just wanted to maybe maybe try and round things up and in terms of um, uh, uh, style of leadership. Do we want to say anything about that um, on the record? Uh, do, do we do things differently as women? Um, does that need to be considered or, or is it is that really been wrapped up in in the various comments we've made? You no, know, it's a manifestation of those things. I'm happy to jump in. Um... I, I believe as sort of women in leadership positions, we have a responsibility to um, women coming through, um, sort of journeying on their or beginning their journey, whether it's their career path or whatever, to um, help amplify voices. So I'm, you know, sort of, uh, I'm now joined on the management team with by, some, by another female. It's, a, it's only one other, but together, if she is, you know, if she's spoken over or she's sort of uh, pushed down or her point ignored, um, I will often say, oh, you know, so-and-so, that, that was a really good point you made. I don't necessarily agree, but blah, 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 blah. Or actually uh, going back to so-and-so's point, and it's about sort of like amplifying those voices. I think mm. that's something that us as sort of female leaders, we should be doing. Mm. Yes, thank you, Marie. That's really, really important. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And to pick up on Marie's point, I think that's, that's a very subtle point. You don't need to be seen as a, an activist to be active. Um, and I think if you find within your environment, within your sphere of influence, you use the tools, the opportunities you have, the occasions you have in, in your own way to do it, it can be done, you can be effective because you're doing it on a consistent basis over, over time, as Marie's example points out. Um, and yet at the same time, it's, um, causing thought over a period of time rather than having to do a one-off series of activism. And I, 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 it lets people again, back to the point of having choice. You can be an, if you want to be an ambassador, great. If you prefer to work behind the scenes, that's great. Use what you have, wherever it is, uh, in whatever sphere of influence you have. Yeah, I think that's, that's a good, it's a good rounding there, round up there. Um, thanks, Joan. Um, any other comments from anybody else? Well, yeah. I, I suppose one thing I very quickly wanted to mention was um, mm. just around social media. And obviously it's it's a great tool and you can change a lot of things and you can reach a lot of people you never would have reached before. And, you know, I've experienced that people I never would have met are now sort of online friends and that's great. Mm. However, I do feel that it's, yeah, it's a difficult place to be as a woman sometimes. 
And, you know, with the things that are on social media, I think one of the things that should be looked at better is, is or in more detail, is, is really how can we protect protect different people better on social media? Because uh, you know, even things like politics, I would never get into politics because I've seen the vitriol that female MPs get because mm. just because they're female. And I think that if, you know, if we do want to effect change in in those sort of wider circles i just think that there needs to be a real serious look at structurally what can be done to protect women because you know <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a pretty confident woman but there are things that i think i wouldn't do because i know you immediately make yourself a target because you're female mm. Mm. i think there's something about not being real you know on social media when you're an imaginary person almost you're not in physically in a room with somebody you're not pressing their flesh you're not looking them in the eyeballs and i i think people, it's very easy to hide behind that and do some quite nasty things and not own up to your actions um mm. but it, it comes back to respect i think you know one of the things we were talking about earlier and being respectful from the start and, and holding that as a, a value point that's not negotiable um, i think i i think as well you know, in the social space, as well as everywhere else, we, we have to encourage women to say that's unreasonable. You know, the, the whole, this, there's this whole sort of premise that women are more resilient than men. And, and I think that's generally true. But I also think it's a bit of a double-edged sword because mm -hmm. I think we've forged our resilience by being constantly put upon. Mm. and having to manage being constantly put upon we've got yeah. tough right and i think we've got to redefine what resilience is you know and turn it into a strength rather than oh god i'm just buckling down and getting on with it you know yeah. and yeah. temper that res resilience with assertiveness and courage you know mm. so that we yeah i think that's i think that's absolutely brilliant and actually is a perfect place to end the conversation on that on that high note um i'm going to be assertive right now and <laughs> <laughs> um just bring everything to a close i've been nudged that i need to sort of uh, join that session but i think that is a really good place to end um uh, end on um, thank you all for that i'll do my very best now to try and portray as much of that as i can um, with the rest of the group. So I'm going to sign off now and I'll be back shortly. Thank you all. Uh, an international perspective, from a journalist perspective, from activist perspectives, we had a young student who spoke about the importance of countering a lot of things related to uh, migrant domestic workers. One of them is the Kafala system. We had a discussion also on the importance of sexual harassment and countering sexual harassment via harass tracker. So basically a lot of discussions and important uh, deliberations that boil down to one thing. We also had our executive director talk about the importance of having uh, International Women's Day as a, a, a practice that we do every day and not just, and that's exactly what we do at the Institute. So the, the panelists reiterated the importance of feminist solidarity, the importance of youth activism, the importance of journalism in, in making women's voices heard in basically the importance of women in decision-making positions and the importance of countering everything related to gender-based violence. I will stop here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Miriam. And now let's go to Aman. Mary Nazal, can you hear us? Yes, Elizabeth, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Wonderful, we had an excellent panel discussion um, here. So I'll just summarize a few points for you. So we spoke about the need to create a happy and safe work environment for women where stereotypes are not allowed to be verbalized. We spoke about the guilt that women feel when trying to manage their multiple roles, both personal and professional. Um, we spoke about stereotypes as well uh, a second time, but specifically about women themselves recreating stereotypical images about themselves. We spoke about the need to listen to women, like I just mentioned, listen to their needs and wants. Um, we spoke about the importance of legislation. Uh, we spoke about uh, COVID being disproportionately harsh on women 
and that we need more gender focused projects and uh, and funds and we need to integrate gender equality into Jordan's national economic strategy. We spoke about the fact that the world is moving at a very fast pace, especially towards the digital era, and that we need to be able to keep up uh, with that, uh, you know, the future of work and so on. Uh, we spoke about the gender gap in the workforce. We spoke about uh, authenticity and how important it is to remain compassionate and empathetic. And uh, I have a lovely quote here, women can change their world even if they can't change the whole world. Uh, you know, a theme that came out a lot was how women are usually shy about their successes and achievements and that we shouldn't be. Uh, we should own, you know, our achievements. And uh, the Ambassador of Canada also spoke to that. Uh, we spoke about Jordan being a conservative community and how we have to work within that reality and we have to work within shifting that mindset. But there was a sense of optimism that we have gone through the door and progress is happening, even though it may be happening slower than we would like. Um, and we spoke about, uh, I want to leave that. Oh, having women executives, you know, does it make a difference for young women? I think the uh, consensus is that it does and the power of knowledge we spoke about the power of knowledge and confidence to break gender stereotypes uh, and i think a final point is that we need to stop uh, being apologetic we should fight labels we need to set uh, limits and uh, an interesting point is we need to stop being defined vis-a-vis -vis our relationship to men thank you Thank you, Mary. We endorse all your findings and, and main points in Amman. Thank you very much. Can we now go to Birmingham and connect to Millie? Thank you very much. We had a fantastic debate in our room um, with three really pertinent themes coming to the forefront. The first was all around framing and language, the second around scale, and the third around what kind of actions do our young people want to see? Well, on the topic of framing, we think it's really important that when we're looking at gender issues, we approach it from an intersectional lens and that we're aware of all of the injustices that are happening around the world and how actually the sort of gender movement can exist to uplift and empower women from a real diversity of backgrounds. We think it's really important not just to have diverse women at the table, but also to critically analyse, are they able to speak when they're there and what opportunities are given once you are in the room? And finally, just on that point, we think it's really important to emphasize the need for internal allyship and women of diverse backgrounds, supporting each other, learning from each other and pushing the movement forward. On the questions of scale, we talked about change that can happen at a household level through conversations uh, with siblings, with friends, with people in your own communities. And actually that then cascades and can create greater change. But we also talked about the importance of, of language in the classroom and how the expectations and the sort of biases that you learn both consciously and subconsciously um, in the classroom environment really go on to impact aspiration and action in, in later on in life. Um, and we think that we need to look at that area too. Finally on actions, the young people in the room today, they spoke about the need for, for role models. You can't be what you can't see. Um, we talked about unlifting and spotlighting the, the fantastic work that is being done alongside looking at our media, how do we represent women more broadly and how can we really showcase uh, fantastic what they're doing. A very final point was made about the need for male allyship um, and especially in, in those in, in positions of leadership, high profile positions and political leaders calling on them to address some of their own biases and really uplift uh, women from all backgrounds. Thank you very much, Millie. And is Karachi, can, it hear, can you hear us Karachi? Moaz, Atiya, I see her nudging you. Hello, Moaz. Hello, Elizabeth. Apologies. That's all right. We're getting on with, with you, Max. So we're getting back to London and then we will try to link again to Karachi. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll do my best here to sort of summarise for, for my panel, this panel discussion, which was very rich and actually some of the points that we made resonated with some of the things I've just been hearing right now. So I'll try not to repeat where possible. Um, uh, a very broad discussion. Um, we, we talked about um, uh, the home and the home being the start of everything and having positive 
um, mother role models in the home supported by a positive father role model was extremely important for setting a nurturing environment for uh, young men and young women. Um, we talked around the systemic issues that are related with working structures. So working women are disadvantaged. The system doesn't allow them to uh, necessarily get the right jobs in the right places when they need that. Um, the structures around child care support, as we know, are not as good as they might be. And then when once in the workplace, there are further barriers that are, are sort of exist that just either stop a work, woman from working the way she wants to or indeed prevent her from, in fact, uh, developing her own career path. And in that context, language was felt to be very important. So words like bossy and ambitious, which are used to downplay women's uh, 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 characteristics um, should be replaced with, you know, more positive sounding words uh, that you more probably use within sort of in a male context. Um, the financial disparity that women have compared to men is also seems to be something that um, needs to be tackled and is a barrier that's so large it does stop women from becoming empowered. Um, women should help other women by amplifying women's voices. So um, something that came up in last year's panel about leaving the ladder down behind you was essentially sort of reiterated re this time around. We each have a responsibility to amplify the, the, um, uh, the voices of other women and use all tools and opportunities that we have at our discretion to enable that to happen. Um, the importance for women to feel and be authentic, so to lead in a way that's natural for them, to dress in the way that makes them feel comfortable, to speak using words that make them feel as if they're properly communicating, um, um, etc. Um, moving on, um, women uh, tend, to, in terms of enabling young women to step into leadership space, um, confidence was something that that we feel needs to be nurtured uh, at a young age and, and to move away from this ideal that girls or women need to be perfectionists in order to be successful and to have confidence. Um, there's a lot around image, the image of women uh, in, the, in social media, the image of women um, and, and around the place um, and that those images need to better reflect um, the positive role models that we, we want to be and see. Um, we also recognise that pandemic, whilst uh, it's been a terrible journey for most people, with every journey there's also a positive. And so um, there are should be and there are opportunities for young women and women to step into spaces and, and make them their own. Um, I think that probably covers most of the main points. Thank from you. London, a a very good. rich conversation. Thank you very much, Max. And I think that uh, Doug is now with us. Doug. How did your panel go? And I have to say, you look content, which is good, but I have yeah. to say that on our side, uh, we have been quite critical about the role of media in uh, how media portrays women and whether, you know, I... there's equal representation. Sorry, I don't mean to attack at all. <laughs> okay, well, in fact, they, they, I think the biggest uh, criticism of media is that we look upon ourselves all the time. And our panel did that. And uh, in fact, the, the panel was varied. One person I didn't mention earlier uh, was Bianca McConey, who is a young uh, journalist who has recently came through an apprenticeship here. And Avianka is a early 20. And it was interesting that the parallels between uh, her view and those of other more senior journalists who were also on the panel. And they agree that it's getting better, but Avianka was particularly particularly saying she thought that there was a lack of um, rapport between some of the women of, uh, with those with different skills and backgrounds and that if they interacted more and gave support. And it was interesting what was said by some of your other panelists about mentors and mentoring, which obviously is something that uh, uh, you, Elizabeth, are very keen on pushing. This actually helps and bridges the gaps. The other um, point was that I heard uh, one of the other panels was saying was listening and everybody agreed that listening was actually one of the most important things and listening and giving space and creating uh, opportunities 
for um, women particularly after children that's returning to the industry coming back at the same level and that was another important point and that um, uh, went in media but also outside of media when in politics and many of those around the panel said they wouldn't go into politics because of the social media criticism of women particularly women of color and that the social media took a lot of blame for the antagonism and and actually um verbal assault almost and this was felt very strongly by all ages by the younger and the more mature so social media still needs to get its act together but uh, the last word was be be aware of the danger of complacency because while things have increased there um, is particularly more room for improvement and don't be complacent the fact that there are now women editors of several national newspapers um, there's still a, a dearth of women executives according to the panel that we had here Thank you, Doug. Well, social media, I call it a beast and it is very difficult to, to control or to contain and there needs to be some self-regulation there and something that the owners need to look more seriously into because it poses serious threats to our democracies. But the mainstream media, I think we all, all of us expect to see more representation and more diversity of voices in mainstream media. Thank you so much for these insights. Okay. And moving on now to uh, Karachi. Moaz, yes. can you hear Hello, us? Can you hear me? Yes, please. Yes, uh, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, well, some of the themes that we discussed were actually very similar, particularly this last theme that was shared by London panel, uh, particularly on media and media representation that we don't have uh, women editors uh, within uh, our, our panel uh, at the different uh, news organizations. So as such, that's been, that, was a, that was a key point that was mentioned. Uh, in respect to media, there was also reference to in, is it increasing the divide or bringing people together uh, regardless of gender? And we kind of spoke a little bit about the element of inclusivity. Um, and so that was uh, that was something. And of course, gender sensitization was a key area, area that was discussed that often at times when uh, people may uh, perceive something, uh, particularly in language, uh, there's a there's a very famous um, slogan that's uh, very popular in Pakistan when it comes to Women's Day by Aurat March that's called Mera Jism Meri Merzi, which means my body, my choice. And sometimes these words are misinterpreted as uh, our one of our panelists, Tasneem uh, Ahmed uh, 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 said that this actually sometimes gets misunderstood to mean something like free sex, which actually in reality, it actually is a place of anger. And there's a lot of um, back history to this that oftentimes that people don't sensitize themselves to. Um, there was a discussion on uh, with Dr. Sarah Qureshi about breaking barriers that have never been broken. Um, and uh, not only that, but scientific barriers as she's, you know, works in science and the development of, of jet engines and the challenges of being the only women um, on that. And she shared some certain skill sets that are important for young women to kind of take away from that, to be persistent, uh, have self-esteem, faith in themselves, fulfill the societal roles, uh, but yet at value time and make good use of the opportunities. Um, there was a discussion uh, that was interesting because we kind of went back to a lot of stories uh, that was shared. Um, and there was, a, there was something that was discussed, the mom guilt. And uh, that's often at times how women are in career. And sometimes that's partly from society. And sometimes that is actually built within. Uh, Dr. Masuma shared a very moving story about her, her experience, uh, not only leading Aurat Foundation, which is the leading women's rights foundation in, in, in Pakistan, um, in various political, economic, and against uh, by, uh, empowerment, but also violence against women. Uh, so she spoke about how women, you know, didn't even have a right to vote in some of the rural areas here in Pakistan. And I know some of the capitals may not realize that as an issue uh, that they may be facing, but the reality is in the different geographic spaces where we are, there's different challenges uh, for that. Um, what can be done? Of course, education is a must for everybody um, for without uh, for a cause and any other influences such as politics or religion. World is changing fast, but people are are neglected in the observations of change. Women education um, is, is a key priority. Uh, we also spoke about how profession and career should be gender neutral. 
Um, and then uh, how the capacity of women is all there, but it's the right attitude and the occur encouragement that's missing. And what's really interesting is towards the end, we had a discussion on inclusivity and how men can play a role. Uh, Dr. Masuma shared about her experience. Um, she not only had some advice for, for, for the young women where she said that, you know, persistence and perseverance is key and being very grateful and not being arrogant. Uh, and often at times that we, we, we sometimes forget that we are in a society that has men and women. Um, and so one of the key things that was spoken about how men are providing these spaces and support, um, and that's a role that young men and men who are in the audience and those listening can and can really take to create those spaces to provide that support. Um, so that's it, and pretty much a lot of the same themes that you have echoed. Um, and I Thank guess you. I'll a wealth back of to ideas you. and thoughts and uh, concerns. Thank you so much. Was well, really appreciate and say hello to all your panelists in Karachi. And finally, uh, let's go. Not finally, we have Zagreb and we have Dubai. I see that Leonor is ready to connect with us now. Hello, Leonor. So, hello uh, from Dubai. Um, we have actually. Dubai. Thank you. Do, you. do you want us to go first in Zagreb or do you want us or do you want Dubai first? Let's Elizabeth? go with Dubai first and then we close with you, Leonor. Thank you. Okay. Helen, all ears. Is Dubai listening? Can you hear us? Oh, no. Yeah. Hello, okay. Dubai? Yeah, okay, so some of the key things that we talked about uh, in Dubai was actually the most recent legislations and the changes in the laws in the UAE that do protect women and give women uh, certain um, privileges or what we consider rights, such as equal pay and the paternity and maternity leave and things like that. We also talked about NGOs and civil society organizations and how they can support um, the role of women and women empowerment at all levels. So we were uh, questioned about, um, you know, are we living in a bubble talking about women empowerment when there are people in disadvantaged areas, that this is not even a choice for them. So we discussed um, the impact that NGOs and civil society, civil society organizations can have. Uh, we were talking about empathy and emotional intelligence as keys for leadership. And this is a strength uh, that women have that we can really uh, capitalize on. Being unapologetic, and they said that they talked about the same thing in Amman, but being unapologetic and taking the time to have a life as well as work. Um, I'm going to just quickly um, just highlight some of the key findings from different uh, panelists. Uh, Caroline was talking about women needing to know their rights to be able to challenge if the, the issues that they are facing. Suzanne was talking about um, the women going forward, how you, know, you can be professional, talented, as well as a mom. Um, and juggling, but being unapologetic, like we said earlier. Um, Diana was talking as a lawyer from the legislative uh, areas that have changed in the UAE, but also the GCC being very progressive with the rules around empowerment and employment laws. And then we had Roxana who told us a bit about studying engineering in Poland, and we think this is just a Middle Eastern uh, issue, but actually it is a global, global uh, issue. Um, and especially when she was working in finance and the biases when it comes to specific industries. Uh, Fatma, who is a cybersecurity specialist, was talking about her passion for technology and the fact that she needed to prove herself as a woman in a man's world. Um, the overriding theme was very similar to everyone else all around the world. And we talked about the cultural biases that are intrinsically built in us from a very young age but also the need for us to continue to change the conversation. And whether we think it's a small bubble, it's actually got a ripple effect on everyone everywhere. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you and very over much. To you. Thank you, Helen. And let's close with Zagreb. And then we come back in the room here for some Q&A. Okay. Hi, Elizabeth. Thank you. Um, so we had a very rich conversation here. And we could have gone on for hours and hours and hours. It was a very interesting conversation. Um, I think we can group our conclude. We, we were very similar in some of our conclusions. Oh, so I think we can group them into a couple of things. I think the importance of having role models was stressed. And role models are 
not just um, role models in society. Um, Croatia does need more female leaders, women in, in senior roles, but also parents um, having family who will support us, um, both girls and boys, in following our dreams. Um, we talked about stereotypes um, and why they are true, but they're not complete. I think that was a fantastic phrase that, that was used. Um, and we talked about how we should show our achievements as women and share them, and, and we shouldn't be um, held back by the biases of society in order to be able to do what we want to do. Um, we talked a lot about um, it, also about it being both about girls and boys and about mothers having a role to play in how they bring up their sons and fathers and how they bring up their sons. So it is a conversation for all of us. We did you know, particularly here in Croatia, sort of talk about the difficulties facing women who um, become mothers and juggling that sort of balancing that between having a family, bringing up a family and having a career. And particularly um, for mothers that may have children with special needs, um, how difficult that is and, and how they are judged uh, by society and by often by their peers and, and why that shouldn't be the case. And obviously we talked about education and especially social and emotional learning, um, the need to show emotions, to have empathy, to be able to um, self-care, that activism, I like the phrase activism is self-care, um, and empower um, young girls to have that self-esteem. And that has to start at an early age, but we did say that it has to be both boys and girls. It has to be a conversation by both. So thank you very much for allowing us to take part. Thank you, Leonor. Yes, it has to be uh, all gender conversation, actually. And we're coming back to this room. Thank you to all cities for all participation and supporting Athena 40 and these conversations and the rich insights that you have shared, which are going to be turned into a white paper and distributed across the networks and all of you.